Okay, so I guess we'll get started. Uh, welcome to V2 Institute for the Unstable Media. My name is Michelle Kasperzak, and I'm the newest addition to the curatorial team here at V2. And this uh, tonight is the premiere of the Blow Up series of events that I'm curating. And um, Blow Up is meant to be a uh, kind of a provocation. Uh, each event is going to be uh, slightly different than the other. We're going to mix formats. We're going to mix artists and theoreticians. We're going to uh, combine wacky ideas together and see what happens. No two events are meant to be the same. And uh, alongside each event, we're going to also produce uh, readers. So for tonight, uh, we have a reader, and I apologize <laughs> because we did promise a special edition USB sticks to you all with uh, copies of the ebook reader on it. Uh, I think these USB sticks are on a truck somewhere. I'm not sure where. Slight production delay because they're very special. Um, but uh, the ebook reader is online for you to download. So you just have to go back to v2.nl to the event page and uh, you can pick up the readers there. So that's the idea, is that we'll be doing these uh, provocative events and pairing them with uh, releases of ebook readers that go into depth looking at the, uh, the themes that are explored. So tonight, to launch the series, we're looking at the idea of art for animals. In a way, this is uh, the kind of theme that I hope becomes uh, emblematic of how uh, Blow Up works, uh, introducing ideas that seem kind of uh, absurd or even naive. Um, but doing it in a way that uh, dives into a subject that's quite serious. So for tonight, we have three leading practitioners who have developed art and design projects that are created with animals in mind as the end users and active participants, not people. The first thing you might notice about the projects we're discussing tonight are their uh, inherent disarming charm and humor. Uh, but underneath the projects are uh, issues that we'll examine, like... Uh, how we can have greater empathy for animals, what our relationship to animals is now. Currently, it seems limited to being either friends or food, and what the animal's experience of the art actually might be. Redefining audiences for art also naturally demands that we redefine our notions of what art is and what it's for, raising more questions than answers, ultimately. Relating this theme to technology, I find it interesting that amid the drive to achieve artificial intelligence and the research going into human augmentation, for example, it's interesting to think about how we could think less about talking to computers, which we have created, and instead to talk about commuting, communicating directly with beings that are already much like us in their emotions, behaviors, and drives. The seed for tonight's program was probably sown by watching a friend's cat play a game designed especially for cats on the iPad. I found this really funny. It was a really <laughs> strange incident. I didn't think the cat would have any in interest in the iPad at all, but in fact, the game entertained uh, the cat quite well. So to kick off the evening, we're going to watch Barbie the Cat, hopefully, in the cat uh, play zone behind you there, uh, demo some iPad games for us in our custom-created uh, cat play zone. Of course, knowing cats, it's likely that Barbie is not going to cooperate at the appropriate moment, but uh, anyways, we'll, we'll give it a go. And she's shy, so... I'd prefer it maybe if you stay in your seats and we'll try to watch it from, from the, the image up above. And maybe casually, you can kind of casually walk over later and not freak her out too much. Just, uh, yeah. In fact, it looks like she's hiding, actually, right at the moment. After Barbie's demo, we'll hear from American ar artist Amy Youngs, who's created new habitats for hermit crabs and a lounge space for crickets. Next up will be uh, Dutch writer Wilfred Hoeybeck, who has translated the Epic of Gilgamesh into lexigrams that scientists use to teach language to apes. And last but not least, we'll hear from Italian designer Elio Cazzaval, who has designed a TV for pigs to use, among other speculative design pieces in his work, Utility Pets. After each speaker has presented their work, they'll stay on the couch here, and I'll engage them in a short conversation, talk show style. We'll then proceed to the next speaker and have a group discussion and take audience questions at the end. Once we're finished, you can, if you haven't, haven't done so already, uh, go have an animal-themed cocktail at the bar. Are the animal-themed cocktails ready? The wild zebra? Excellent. And hopefully Barbie is also still up for demoing her gaming skills. Also, please remember, if you do that sort of thing, to uh, tweet about tonight's event using the hashtag V2 underscore. So, without further ado, I'm going to wander over and see if I can coax a demo out of Barbie. Um, we won't spend too long on this, like I say, cats being what they are, and then we'll proceed directly into the talks. So, stay where you are. <laughs> Let's see what I can manage. 
Can I have a cat wrangler uh, assist me, please? <laughs> Let's see if uh, we can maybe get some interest in the fishing game. Um, Okay, yeah. Well, we're going to bring in another cat as a kind of assist. <laughs> I think Barbie looks a little terrified. So, the, yeah, the story behind these iPad games is that there are three games in our, uh, our cat zone tonight. Uh, one is uh, the most popular game is the fishing game, where cats uh, are able to hit an animation of a, of a swimming fish, and if they touch it, the fish dis disappears. The fish animation then comes back, and it gets uh, faster and more difficult to capture as time goes on. What's the second cat's name? Okay, this is the real one. This is the real Barbie. This is mine. But uh, she was lost today, so I brought another one. Okay. Ten minutes, ten minutes before we before we go, and uh, she came up. So. Yeah, <laughs> this is Justine, by the way, everyone. The cat cat whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> The other two games, I think, are a little less successful. These are games that uh, involve the cat touching something that then the image just multiplies, which is not nearly as satisfying as touching a fish and watching the fish disappear. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> the cat just turned around to look at us. I don't think, yeah. Let's leave Barbie alone and move along to our first speaker. It was worth a try, wasn't it? I don't know. I thought maybe miraculously the cat might just uh, cooperate with us. So, uh, allow me to introduce Amy Youngs. Uh, Amy Youngs creates biological art, interactive sculptures, and digital media works that explore the complex relationship between technology and our changing concept of nature and self. She's exhibited and lectured internationally, is a recipient of an Individual Artist Fellowship grant from the Ohio Arts Council. She has an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and she's currently an associate professor in the Department of Art at The Ohio State University. The stage is yours, Amy. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm my slideshow is not up yet. So, uh, yeah, let's have Amy's yeah. slides. Um, thank you, Michelle, and thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited about this topic and being a part of this panel and, and getting to learn about the um, iPad games for cats all kinds of things to learn. Um, I'm going to be talking about some of the art that I've made that is um, designed both for animals and people to interact together. And, um, and I'm titling my talk, Experiencing Art with Other Animals. And um, uh, by other animals, I really do mean to say that we also are animals. And, um, and, that, and that we do a lot of the same things other animals do. Um, and I think about how we used to think that human animals were the only ones that made tools or changed our environments or had empathy. And, and there's a lot of evidence that um, many other species of animals do the same thing. And, and I think that perhaps we should also open up the possibility that maybe they also appreciate art and have a sense of aesthetics that perhaps is, is specific to their species that we may or may not understand. How are we doing with the slides? Slide action. Let's see here. What was the first project you were going to discuss for us with us tonight? Um, let's see if I did switch house to slow. There we are. Sorry. Phew. Ta -da. Ta -da. <laughs> Thank you for cooperating. Well, I'm going to actually start out um, by talking about the animals that I live with. I live with, with four rabbits. And, and, I'm very, and I've had rabbits for many, many years in my life, and, and they're very inspirational to me in a lot of ways um, about thinking about humans' interaction with other species. And in, in living with these rabbits in my house, um, I've become very interested in what interests them and how I could make a more exciting environment for them. Um, they, they don't look at the art. They don't think that my art's very interesting to look at, that anybody else's art in our house, not interesting. But the stairway, very interesting. So this is my rabbit, Cirrus, staring down the stairs. <laughs> They're like sublime to him. He'll stare at them for many, many minutes, which is long for a rabbit. And, um, and, but they never go down the stairs. They're, they're scared. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to them as a place to move. 
Um, but it turns out that you can actually train a rabbit to go down the stairs. So now he does go up and down the stairs. And, and in training, there is a kind of um, a interspecies communication. There's an interaction that happens. And, um, and I think that maybe we could extrapolate that to, to even having um, perhaps um, aesthetic experiences with animals and, and, and appreciating that perhaps our aesthetic experience is different than theirs, um, but, but that maybe we're both still having them. And, and I also think now that he goes up and down the stairs, perhaps he understands my perspective of the stairs differently because he's moving through them instead of just looking at them. I don't know. Or maybe I ruined it for him. I don't know. Um, one of the ways that, um, that rabbits show what they love is they eat the things, and they, they seem to love many of the same things we do, like tulips. Um, a lot of the landscape plants that we enjoy, they also enjoy. So they've sculpted my garden quite a bit, um, and we've appreciated tulips together, and I'm learning to appreciate tulips in a new way. Half eaten, it's okay. Um, probably some of the best art that I've made for rabbits is this long cardboard box that has um, holes cut out of the side of it. It really it gets right into their psychology of wanting to um, move through spaces with many entrances and exits. So they get very excited about that kind of a box. And, and the babies especially love this. And it's a playful interaction that also has to do with their being prey, wanting to get away from, from other animals. Um, and then when the babies grow up, they find new things that they love. And um, this rabbit, the circus boy, loves his fluffy toy. And he really, really loves it. <laughs> he spends a lot of time with this fluffy toy. Maybe even thinks of it as art. I don't know. But it, it holds a special place in his life. Um, and, and on the other hand, I think, well, if he's thinking of this as a really important aesthetic experience, maybe. Maybe it's aesthetic, maybe not. It's not something that uh, we humans would really consider aesthetic at all. Like, it's not interesting to us. So, you know, it's not like I ever show this as art for animals, but it may be a more successful piece of art than something I might make for him. So. Some of the um, projects that I have made specifically for as, as art projects, um, this is a piece called Cricket Call. And in, in this piece, I try to help humans and crickets communicate. Um, and what I've got here is a kind of amplified um, system so that you can hear crickets on the phone. And then you can also um, speak to them with your voice, and it's translated as cricket chirping. Um, I've created this little living room environment with a television so that I, I felt that humans could appreciate crickets better if they related to the environment of the living room. And then I also thought that the crickets could appreciate humans better if they could see them on their, their scale as, as being small on this little television. There we go. <coughs> so, so they do their, their chirping, um, and then also uh, they do their, uh, their viewing of the television screen. And, and they did actually gather around the television screen quite a bit. And I think maybe it's because it was warm. <laughs> but maybe they did actually enjoy the image. I don't know. Hello? Others? Hello? My Hello, husband crickets. talking to the crickets. <laughs> There's a cricket interpreter inside the phone. Hello? And they also enjoyed the piano quite a bit because that's where the food was. So they spent a lot of time inside the piano. But I did, I did feel like, with, you know, I don't really think I was communicating with the crickets or people weren't really, they probably didn't really appreciate the electronic cricket chirp that I made for them. But, um, but I did feel that it did provide a, a way for humans to think about crickets differently. Who knows, maybe crickets also think about humans differently from it. I don't know, hopefully. And this kind of appreciation for crickets is not entirely crazy, really. Um, the Chinese culture has had crickets. They kept them as pets, um, created these beautiful singing gourds for them to chirp in um, with special shades to amplify the sounds of the crickets. So there's a kind of beautiful craftsmanship that goes into that, and then also an appreciation for the cricket chirping sound coming out of it. Um, the little wire cage there is, is meant to be worn on the body so that you keep the cricket the right temperature. It doesn't get too cold. 
Um, and then there's this little clay sleeping houses for them in the summer to keep them cool. So there's a real love and appreciation and craftsmanship that goes into these pieces for, from China. So it's not like I'm totally crazy. This is, this is something other people think about too. <laughs> um, so I started thinking about the type of crickets that I was working with, which are house crickets. These are domesticated crickets. And I, I started wondering about whether or not I could create the perfect environment just for them. Um, and, and one might think that to let crickets go would be the perfect environment. They could be back in the wild, but these are actually domesticated crickets and they would die. So I thought I would make instead an art piece that would protect them and give them a little special bubble to live in. This is the hollow deck for house crickets project. Um, and in it, the crickets were able to sort of experience this um, video moving by them. Um, that was, that was designed to maybe hearken back to their pastoral relatives or the pastoral scenes that their wild relatives might have enjoyed. Um, but it's also only interactive for crickets, so the movement of the video is only going when the chirping is happening. So um, in this piece, I was really very much thinking about how to make something interactive for crickets but not for humans. So it was really about the humans being the passive observers of this situation, whereas the crickets were the ones that could chirp and advance the video. And you know how people are with interactive work. They're clapping their hands, they're screaming at it. None of that worked. You have to have <laughs> like a 48,000 kilohertz or something um, voice, which nobody has in order to make this piece work. So it's really designed for them and also to really think about how to, how to appreciate and protect something that we have domesticated. These are the crickets that you buy in the pet store to feed to your um, lizards and snakes, by the way. So that's, that's our usual interaction with these crickets. Um, oh, one thing that I noticed from this piece um, was that, that the crickets actually did see the video. And I'm pretty sure of that because they would spend some time jumping at the grasses. So whenever the blades of grasses were really distinct, they would actually jump up and try to land on the video, which made me feel terrible. I thought, here I am trying to care about these crickets, and they're hitting the glass as if this video were real. And so I felt pretty bad. I think I'm actually a pretty poor designer for animals and insects in the end. Um, and that takes me to the next piece, which is called Prototypes for Hermit Crab Shells that I created with another artist, Matt Dirksen where we made rapid prototype shells just for hermit crabs. These are the crabs that, they don't grow their own shells, they're just using snail shells. And they, they do get to select, and they are very picky about the shells that they select. So we designed a lot of different types, and we had to design them um, with this kind of like special right-handed twist um, to fit the shapes of their bodies. And we really thought, oh, you know, we'll have all of these interesting shells, and they'll select ours over the natural shells. Um, but, but they really didn't. <laughs> they actually hated all of our designs. And, um, and, and what we found, we, because we did give them all these other choices, they always chose the natural shells over our design shells. Um, and it may be because they were ugly, or maybe because they were smelled bad, they were made of plastic, maybe they were too rough, and, and that, that may well be what was, what was going on. But it, it did really give me a sense of... Oh yeah, and then there's the training video, I forgot to mention. <laughs> the training video was, was really at first a way to show humans what was supposed to be happening here in this situation. Um, but, but actually, I later learned that there is a fish researcher, um, Dr. Cola Brown, who does, he does all of this fish research with videos, and he shows videos to um, fish that were reared in hatcheries about predators that they might meet when they get released in the wild. And it's very successful. So these fish have a better success rate when they watch videos of what to do when predators come along. So I thought, all right, so maybe I'm not so far off with my, my little training video for crabs. Um, I did design a glass shell with some glass blowers, and, and one of my crabs did finally move into a glass shell, which was really kind of creepy to see. Um, and he chose this over many other natural shells that were there, so I felt very proud about that. It was really an exciting moment for me until I realized, <laughs> and he realized later, that it was way too heavy for him, and he completely fell over all the time, and he, after a week or so of trying to lug this heavy glass shell around, 
he gave it up and he moved back into his old shell. So I was kind of sad. Again, I felt like I was a complete retard for designing for animals. Um, so this next piece is really more about trying to design an experience for worms and humans. Um, an interactive experience where they eat meals together on, on this piece called Digestive Table. And, and in this piece, um, living worms, composting worms, are in the, um, the black uh, um, shaped part in the middle of the table. And there's a kind of a portal hole at the top where um, you could feed the worms your leftover food. So you're having this experience of feeding the worms, watching the worms on this little television screen that's built into the table. And then also, um, you can harvest the worm casting. So the fertilizer that the worms are making right there at the table for you could be harvested and then fed to the plants that are there under the table. So it's really a way to show an interaction that's always occurring. You know, and it's, it's something to think about that we're always having this material communication between worms and humans where, where we've, we're creating all of this waste. What's waste to us is food for them. What's food for them gets transformed into fertilizer for the plants that we eat and love in our landscape. So there's this kind of wonderful circular system that's always going on that, um, that this piece is really meant to highlight. You know, whether or not, whether or not the um, worms think of this as art, I, I don't know, but I, I hope that the humans have a different kind of an appreciation for, for where their food is coming from and the cycle of food and eating. Um, and then there was also a sense of having, um, having a, a system that worked really well. This, this system works beautifully, and it never smells bad. And so that was, that was one of the things I was really interested in doing, so that a system that smelled, like if it was a worm system that smelled, nobody would want to eat it. It would be unesthetic for humans and for the worms, too. So, so it was really important that it be very breathable, and the worms were happy and well-fed, and, you know, the security camera system wasn't going to be too bright for them. So it was really about thinking about their needs, too. Oh, and there, there they are on screen, um, wiggling around, doing their business. Um, and then this piece is um, the last piece I'm going to show you, River Construct. And it's a kind of an ecosystem project that I did that actually had a rabbit in it. So I'm back to the rabbits again. And um, in this project, I, I was using worms as a way to fertilize a hydroponic system. So instead of feeding the hydroponic plants chemicals, I was feeding it worm poop, <laughs> which was being um, generated by rabbit poop in this system. So it's a kind of a, an enclosed ecosystem indoors. Um, the rabbit, River Eddie, there, is um, pooping away in his little enclosure. And um, then the poop gets swept up. And then it gets put into these worm buckets. And these worm buckets um, are included into a stream of water that's uh, powered by the sun. So it's a solar-powered pump that would, that would drive the water up to, um, is it the other way? Oh, going the wrong way there. Up to the uh, top of the ladder where the plants um, were, and then it would trickle through each successive bucket, much like a river, but a river on a, buck on a ladder. And, um, and fertilize and water the plants all at the same time. And then it would um, collect at the, wa at the bottom and be recycled through. And this kind of a system is, is incredibly efficient. Um, it uses sunlight and rabbit poop. <laughs> so the rabbit was really actually um, designed as part of, as part of this um, ecosystem, integrated in with it. And, and for me, it was a really interesting way to think about a rabbit, too, because um, the rabbit is one of those beings that can be almost anything to anyone. So we talked about how um, animals are often thought of as food or, or pets, <laughs> but um, rabbits could also be fur and entertainment and scientific research subjects and show rabbits. Um, and this particular rabbit was a show reject rabbit. So it was like, did bad on the show table, and, and the breeder was trying to get rid of him. So I took this rabbit and put him into my art show exhibition. So he was transformed as a kind of an exhibition rabbit um, that was also really there as a useful fertilizer for the system. 
And then in the end, he was then again transformed into a pet rabbit. So somebody brought him home and, and had him as their house rabbit. So it was this kind of um, transformation of this animal over time that, that I was really interested with in this piece in the end. It was a different kind of an ecosystem that happened around this ecosystem. And that sort of um, transformation of this animal in relation to this cultural project was, was what was really exciting to me. So this is kind of art for animals and with animals, maybe. Great, thanks. Wonderful. Um, yeah. <laughs> so now to the uh, Oprah part of this uh, this show. Um, I wonder if you could maybe actually tell us a little bit more, uh, take us back uh, in time to when you were starting, considering starting to do this kind of work. And um, I mean, it's a very difficult. Uh, thing, you're not getting feedback, it's hard, but the crabs, for example, it's, uh, they're not telling you why uh, they're rejecting your design. So um, what drew you to that particular challenge? It was actually more about, uh, I think I'm drawn to the idea that um, as an artist, I can help other people get excited about, uh, as excited about animals as I am. So it's sort of my own obsession and love for animals and my desire to help sh to share that with other people. Um, and also try to really respect the animal at the, at the same time. So there's this hope that I will be respectful and not harm, harm the animal, but also a real hope that I'll bring other people into this sort of obsession. And, um, and sure, I don't, I don't get feedback from the animals. I think the feedback I get is usually rejection, <laughs> you know, like, we hate your designs. And, um, or, you know, a lot of different kinds of problems happen um, where, say, crickets die all the time. And it turns out when they're at chirping age, they're about at the end of their lives. So you always have dead crickets, which looks bad in your art show, you know. So there are a lot of really difficult issues with working with animals. But, but for me, I, I'm always thinking about it as, but it's important to see animals in the world. It's important for them to be here, and it's important for us to think about them um, maybe as equals. Like, they should be equal to us. I, I don't see why we shouldn't think about them and respect them more. So it's a, it's a question of respect. Respect, <laughs> yeah. And I think uh, maybe jumping off from respect a little bit, uh, in terms of your exhibition experiences with these uh, works, have you run into any problems? I know there have been, you know, several instances that I've heard of where things have been yanked from exhibitions because local uh, animal rights groups protest and say, you know, it's un even if it's a really nice living room environment, they might say that it's not natural, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not respecting um, the creature involved. And uh, have you ever had to deal with that? And how, would, if so, how did you handle it? Well. Um Mostly people don't care about insects, it turns out. So <laughs> it turns out that there are very few people that really care what you do with insects. But there, but there were people who challenged me on that during exhibitions. Um, and they said, I'm surprised the PETA people aren't here to complain about how small your cricket bubble is, you know. <clears throat> and then I explained to them, and, and this is great. Like, this is an interesting thing for me to think, like, well, do you know where these crickets came from? And they came out of a little box at the pet store. Um, you know, let's talk about what their lives are like, and let's talk about how different my bubble might be from that, um, from that typical life that they might have. And, and so it's also just about education. I think people don't really know what goes on <laughs> in the animal and insect world. And I should also say that I had some complaints from people about the, this last piece I did. Um, but more email complaints, people who were um, upset that the rabbit was purchased from a breeder, for instance. No, 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 you should get the rabbit from a, um, from a shelter or something, you know. But no shelter lent me. I, I did ask, and they wouldn't lend me a rabbit. So <laughs> you know, it was a very interesting dialogue, though, that I had with people about what was OK to do and not OK with the rabbit. I, I found it actually a really interesting part of the piece for myself because I once was a rabbit breeder <laughs> and they're thought of, thought of as very evil and this idea that, that, that the rabbit breeder isn't evil, it's just sort of, you know, she's trying to get rid of rabbits that aren't doing well on the show table and this seemed like a pretty good option, so. And you did uh, discuss that a little bit in the, the piece that's in the ebook reader about uh, having to cull animals and, and right. these kinds of ethical decisions. And um, so I imagine with that kind of a background that informed the work that, you, uh, that you're doing. 
like all the all your experience breeding was there anything in particular that stood out as like a a, a lesson <laughs> with um breeding rabbits yeah yeah well yeah i think that i think you do as when i was breeding rabbits i was a, a 4-h person which is the the kind of you might, have, you might have to explain <laughs> what 4-H is. Okay, so when when you're a child, you, you and you can do um, projects like you can raise animals and show them in the fair, and um, so I did rabbits and um, had lots and lots of rabbits and showed them at all these rabbit shows, um, which was which was a really exciting thing for me and very formative because it was this sense of changing living things over time. Breeding rabbits it happens pretty quickly, so you can actually really see almost like you're sculpting a creature, and it's a crazy thing. But, um, but, you, but I did tend to see them more instrumentally, like it was much more of an object and less of a pet because I had so many, and it was all about, it was a beauty contest in this situation. So yeah, I think that, that Looking back on that, I, I'm now trying to think of rabbits differently, and you know, really only think of them as pets and equals, and I don't know, e trying to think of them that way. Well, and they're singled out in your works as performers or, or on display. That was another thing uh, you you raised in your uh, papers that are uh, in the ebook was uh, about transitioning from that idea of displaying an animal to that idea of the animal just enjoying an environment or uh, being interactive with an environment. And I thought that was actually really uh, relevant for, uh, in the way that we uh, as, as artists are educated to create things for display. Art school shows you how to do that. You uh, learn how to create objects that are on display for a public. Um, and that uh, artists who work in digital media have to think about it from the other angle, which is how do audiences interact with my piece, which is not necessarily a, a mode that, um, that all artists work with, or that you have to teach yourself sometimes, or at least mm -hmm. back in the day, what I remember people did, they had to teach themselves. So for you, was that a difficult transition to make as a, you know, I mean, I, I think ever, all of us have these, uh, these art school experiences, and then we go off to, um, to, to work in the real world and developing interactive work like this. Can you talk a bit about that transition a little bit? Sure, yeah. I, um I actually learned a lot about interaction by working at a science museum um, in San Francisco. They have the Exploratorium, which is this um, one of the early hands-on science museums um, that also does science, art, and human perception. So it's a really much more interdisciplinary way, and it's also meant for all ages. So they would actually have artists come in and build projects. And I was one of the people that had to take care of the projects. I was like the technician that would fix things when, when they broke. And I also got to really experience um, audiences interacting with objects in a way that I think got me very excited about making interactive work. So I think that's really where I learned about interactive art. Hmm. And did you spend much time watching people in the, in the museum? You were probably very busy fixing what the yeah. ki kids were running around breaking, but. Yeah, I did, <laughs> I did. I, I, one thing I, I'll say that I noticed is that people love to see themselves reflected in technology. So that's a technique that I used in the cricket call piece, for instance. There I am on the tiny TV, wow, you know, suddenly they're interested. Um, so, you know, there's a few kind of tricks you learn along the way about what people like to see. I, I thought of that as well when I was uh, thinking of your first slide of the rabbit at the top of the stairs, because I think the rabbit looking down the, the top of the stairs at the, at the bottom, it's almost like it's, it's a freeze frame, it's TV. It's what's, whatever walks by becomes part of the scene. So in a way it might be a version of that. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I, had, I hadn't <laughs> thought of that, but yeah. And uh, so the, I, where, where are you going from here with it? Where, what are your next thoughts on developing more things along this line? Uh, are you developing more things along this line or are you now moving in a completely different direction? Um, maybe a slightly different direction, but, um, but still with animals. The, the project that I'm currently beginning to develop with another artist has to do with pigeons and urban feral pigeons and thinking about how to how to rethink pigeons as um, less of pests and more as partners. So we're thinking about how to design cities better so that we can integrate pigeons and, um, and even eat the baby pigeons. <laughs> I say that with hesitation, but, but so this idea that they're actually part of our world. They're not just a pest, they're also something that's creating food and pigeons, baby pigeons apparently taste delicious. So. So it's Who, a who's different kind of, <laughs> you know, you'd have like a local barbecue and you'd all enjoy the pigeons together. 
Okay. You know? And, you know, it seems like kind of horrific, but yeah. on the other hand, when you really <laughs> think about what goes on with um, pest management, it's pretty much poison. So we're trying to think of alternative ways to not just kill every single pigeon off, which is actually not even possible, it turns out. Um, but, and, and not not just put poisons everywhere to get rid of the pigeons, but instead try to think about how to utilize pigeons and have them be a partner in the city instead. So it's a different kind of interaction with animals, for sure. <laughs> yeah, and it, uh, I guess it's kind of an extension of the uh, urban foraging movement in a certain kind of way. I mean, when we yeah. get really desperate, we can always harvest the pigeons. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pigeon sandwiches all around. Great. All right, well, let's, uh, let's move along then to uh, Wilfred, and we'll have to do a quick... Uh, tech change over here, but okay. thanks, Amy. I promised everyone there would be no blue screen, and, and there isn't, which is great. So uh, we're going to have uh, Wilfred next, and uh, I'll just introduce him. Uh, Wilfred Huybeck is a Dutch thinker, psychogeographer, and writer. I made up this bio, by the way. <laughs> He's a very mysterious individual. The V2 website has the best bio, by the way, according to Google. Anyway, uh, he uses algorithms to design psychogeographic walks through cities and other areas. The geographic and psychological output is visualized with the help of simple software. His work in other areas include primate poetics, which he's going to talk about tonight, and cryptoforestry. He's also been known to engage in a little urban food foraging. That's true. That's true. Anyway, uh, in fact, that's where we last met. It's also true. It was on an urban, urban food forage near Amsterdam Sloterdijk, which I didn't think there was going to be anything there to eat at all. It turned out we found something everywhere. Yeah, yeah, we found some really delicious things. So if you ever uh, get a little tired of the prices at Albert Heijn, I highly recommend uh, going down to Amsterdam Sloterdijk and... Uh, at the traffic roundabout. At the traffic roundabout. Eat. There's a lot of uh, wild rocket. It's wonderful. Was that okay as an intro? Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to talk about primate poetics. Yeah. I would have to say, though, that uh, on a different note, uh, the thing about the eating, eating the pigeons, uh, what you were saying about if things get really nasty and we need to survive, we can always eat pigeons. I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I mean, a forager... I mean, from a, from a, from a, I mean, there's two foraging traditions. Um, the first one is sort of SAS survival, men, men, the SAS survival book, uh, which is about su survival, su I mean, uh, making the best of a worse situation and don't get poisoned and uh, su survive in a harsh condition. But the, like a, a modern day forager doesn't look at, uh, at, at, at the idea of eating a dandelion, for instance, that's something nasty and brutish, which you can only do in, ex in, in, in times of extreme necessity, but as something uh, joyous and as something uh, wonderful and as something um, that helps you discover the richness of nature even growing between the cracks of the pavement in the street, in a, in a city street. That's true, yeah. So let's not look at it as an act of desperation. Let's That's look at eating pigeons and dandelions yeah. and all kinds of things with joy. Welcome it into our, into our life. But yeah. I only say that because I wrote a blog about it today. Oh, okay. You did have the SAS handbook with you, though, on the walk, didn't you? No, it's another book. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a, <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I actually wrote about it on the, on, the, on the blog, because the SAS survival book spends as much time on poisonous plants as on edible plants. Oh, okay. It's because we live in a dangerous world and you need to know about these things. Well, the Food for Free uh, book, which I had, which is a hippie classic from 1972, and it doesn't dwell on poisonous plants at all. Um, because it just doesn't enter the mind frame. It's, it's all, I mean, we're hippies and everything is good and everything is happy. Until you eat the bad mushroom. Um, if you know what you're doing, that will never happen. Okay. Well, I was glad I was guided by people who knew what they were doing, let's put it that way. So. Uh, well, it's an interesting subject, but maybe not. <laughs> maybe for maybe another not time. For yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, take it away. Yeah, so... Um, uh, so my, um, I've been working on a project called Primate Poetics. Um, I guess you know what, what a primate is. Uh, and after I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about definitions first, just to get it out of the way. Um, and then I'll move on uh, to a bit about animal language research as it developed the last 50 years. Uh, and then I'll move on uh, 
to uh, the Gilgamesh translation for apes. I, I, I mean, this is a bit boring, but we just have to get through it. Uh, this is a quote from Shelley, which he made in a defense of poetry in uh, the beginning of the 18th century. Every original language near to its source is itself the chaos of a cyclic poem. The copyness of lexography and the distinctions of grammar are the works of a later age and are merely the catalog and the form and creations of poetry. Um, so what I, what I think, well, um, I mean, what, he, what he's really saying is that um, poetry is naming things. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm, I'm, well, just, just let me give, me, give me a second. Here's another quote, which is a bit earlier. Um, Anyone who wishes to excel as a poet must learn all his native language and return to the pristine beggary of words. Now, what I think these two um, quotes refer to, um, that, well, I mean, the first thing they do is that they discredit all, everything that we recognize as poetry today is not really poetry. Uh, you know, I mean, once you, I mean, if you see poetry, you immediately recognize it as poetry. Well, these quotes seem to su seem to suggest that um, poetry language is only in a poetic state when it's new and fresh, and when it's being invented, and when every um, when when even the words for the most simplest thing have still to be invented. Um, so you enter a world, um, and there's not even an, a name for a chair, or a wall, or a house, um, and that's real poetry. So um, what the second thing that leads to, of course, is that um, poetry is really, really rare. I mean, there's only a few instances in human history when language was tr truly new. Um, um, and as it happens, uh, that's, that's the second, that's, that's, that's the, 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 I mean, if you look at it like this, um, we're in a, I mean, we're in a very happy uh, age because we're actually have been, I mean, there's a tradition of humans trying to teach a language to an ape or to apes or specifically great apes, gorillas, uh, bonobos, orangutans, and chimpanzees. Um, so, um, and my, my take on this, I mean, I was just reading today a piece by, uh, an article by um, Sue, Savan, Sue Savage Rumble, and she's probably the most important person in ape language research of the last 50 years, and she's in Ohio. Uh, she's working in Ohio at the moment. Um, and she was writing that apes are using exactly the same kind of language as we do. Um, and I don't, I don't agree with her. I mean, which is a bit like arguing with Einstein over relativity theory. Um, but still, um, because I don't, I don't actually, I mean, looking at all the books and all the reports over the, over the years, and, and there's not much going on at the moment. There's only one serious project. Uh, but there have been several in the 1960s, 1970s. Um, and the general picture I get from that is that um, you don't really teach language to an ape. That's just a, that's just a front cover. That's just a way to, to get research grants. Uh, and sure, people try to try to uh, teach language, or try to get the get the ape to speak, um, but it never really happens in the way uh, it's meant to be, uh, or the way it's meant to happen, or the way research wants it to happen. Well, that's saying it twice. But um, um, what I mean by that. Just pushed another button and it worked. <laughs> um, so, um, I mean, to give you a really, really quick uh, overview of the of the research, um, I mean, I mean, people have recognized that apes are very, I mean, great apes are very similar to us. Um, and ever since people saw f ape for the first time, it was immediately the suggestion that maybe it could talk because it's so similar. Um, and modern science, I mean, things like um, uh, genomics, have only uh, made this even more even more clear. I mean, the chimpanzee really is very much like like us. Uh, in fact, the chimpanzee, for instance, is more more close to us than the chimpanzee is to the gorilla. Um, so, so, I mean, the qu question then, very simple: Can an ape learn language? And at first, they they started with uh, rearing baby apes as humans, and then see if they would pick it up naturally as human babies do. You know, humans baby do. Um, and at first, 
and it started out with a, with a f it started out with a failure that ended up as a as actually a triumph, in the sense that no apes don't learn a language if you treat them like a human child or a human baby because they simply can't speak. I mean, they can't make a consonant sound because their uh, throat or their voice box is not uh, wired the right way. Um, but on the other hand, and it wasn't really realized at the time, they actually uh, understood a language a quite a great deal, and they could understand conversations. Um, and another thing that happened very early on was that, um, for instance, in one of the first cases with Jim Vicky, who failed to learn uh, human language, but then uh, son Donald, who was very young, he was two, and he st started speaking human language, he started to make foot runs like a chimpanzee. Um, and, that, and, this is and this is exactly, um, I think, the, what is the point? I mean, the ape doesn't learn. I mean, it's not that, that it's, it's not a one-way system. There's our language and there's the ape, and we just, f I mean, you pour it in like we pour water into a bucket. Um, I mean, language doesn't work like that. It's a, it's a two-way system. Um, and once you, if you want to learn the language, of, if you want to learn language to an ape, it also means you have to learn the language of the apes, uh, which they have to a certain extent. So w once that was realized, I mean, once the language potential was still recognized as existing, um, but uh, the, 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 c the capacity to sp to for speech was, uh, you know, was made sure that it didn't exist. Um, there were several attempts um, to think of an alternative. Um, I mean, there's two main ones, which is um, sign language, American sign language, mostly used by uh, deaf people, um, which has a few advantages. I mean, it's very easy. You don't need any tools. I mean, it's just your hands. Um, and it's very natural. It's very spontaneous. On the other hand, it's very hard to document. It's very, I mean, you have to, you have, to have the camera on the right side. And it's very ambiguous. Um, and with what didn't help that, I mean, these projects work with, with graduate students, and they didn't speak uh, sign language. Or they didn't, uh, I mean, I, I say didn't speak, but that's of course the right, the wrong phrase. Um, but, um, so you get this, so you get the situation where the ape spoke better sign language than the, than the, than the human did. Uh, and, the ape knew, and the ape knew this. So you would get cocky students who think, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach, teach language to an ape, and then they would be completely, um, mocked by the ape who would speak like you would do to a foreigner, very loud or very, you know, Italian. <laughs> um, so, um, so I mean, I mean, it's a great, I mean, I mean, there's things to say for it, but it's, it's very hard to, uh, I mean, it's very hard to substantiate in the long run. Another, f another um, classic example is uh, that, it, that you would have a lot of graduate students and this would be around the clock and they would have to uh, write down the, the signs a chimp would make every 50 minutes, for instance. Um, and it turned out that um, the students who, did, who were not uh, natural uh, sign language users um, n uh, sort of uh, saw much more uh, signs than did uh, deaf people who would actually use the sign language as a native language. And I mean, and the difference was not just a bit, but maybe like uh, only 20%, I mean, a deaf person would only recognize 20% of the gestures as real uh, signs. So that's quite a, quite a discredit. Um, so. Uh, that's that's why it didn't really work. And then the second thing was, um, the second the second method was the use of lexigrams, um, which is what you see here, which was developed uh, by Dwayne Rumbaugh, a German cybernetician, cyberneticist, Ernst von Glasenfeld in 1977. And there were like I think 122 symbols. And I, I mean, they look they look very pretty. And they're all made of a few limited symbols: a circle, a square, the lines. I mean, there's a certain elegance to them. Uh, very sort of Kraftwerkian. Um, but I mean, the problem with them is that they're all very similar. So that's f they're very hard to remember. Um, and, this, and again, that's not how language works. You can't design a language and expect it to function because language is much more rich than what, you know, some crazy German scientist can think of behind his desk. <laughs> um, so um, the lexigrams uh, evolved over time. And this is, um, there's three panels. You can download them from the Great Ape Trust in uh, Ohio, this is one of them, and you can well you can see clearly that they have evolved, and you can recognize some of the original uh, lexigrams, uh, but you can also see that um, there's, there's the f I mean there's three of them, so there's uh, I think something like uh, nearly 200 of them. Uh, some of them are names, some of them are uh, there's a lot of foods. I think one third of them are foodstuffs, from M&Ms to uh, you know healthy things. <laughs> um, 
So there's words, there's uh, Japanese characters, there's all sorts of stuff going on there. Um, so uh, let me see. So that's so that's the lexigram system, um, and this is how it used how it's used. Um, this is uh, uh, Bonobo Kenzi, and um, the person is uh, Sue Savage Savage Rumba. Um, and they're working with this huge. Um, well, they've got they've got different system, but this is the like this is this is what they use in ordinary conversation. Um, I mean, you can see the downside. It's a bit, you know, um, impractical. Um, well, I mean, the app communicates and it communicates if he. I mean, if he's got something to say, he doesn't only respond to questions, or he doesn't only use it to get food, uh, which was long believed. Um, and another thing about it is that. Um, but this is, th I mean, if you would look at it like this, you would think that it's only at this, that this is, this, that this is the, the, the language, this is what's research and this is what they're doing. Uh, but actually, if you read about it, you'll find that um, um, Kenzie is trying to foc focalize uh, human words. And at the same time, Sue Savage Rumbo is, is uh, using chimpanzee words to name things. So she has this thing where she saw a snake and uh, Kenzie immediately, uh, instinctively made a a bonobo sound, and she used that ever after as a word for snake because it sounded much more, because it felt much more natural than the, than the proper English word for snake. So there you get this, um, so that the real language, the real communication happens not in um, what's presented, or what's, what you know, what's put on the research, but in the, in the daily communication. It works all ways. So you get this mixture of ape language designed by humans. You get human language, ape language, ape is human language. I mean, so you get to get humans trying to vocalize like an ape, for instance. But then, of course, that's, that's I mean, probably to an ape, that sounds just completely bonkers. Um, but they still manage um, to get something out of it. So they, 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 they actively need to interpret and translate it. Um, so, but I mean, I sh I'm talking a bit too much about this. So let's move on. Um, so, um, I mean, so, and, we, and then you can think of, all, of ape language as, as it's documented, as, an, as, a, as a kind of poetry. Uh, because the ape uh, is naming the world for the first time in a completely new language. Uh, and it's doing this in its own way. Not in the way humans want it to do, but in the way the ape himself wants to do it. Um, and then I just said the ape itself. If you want to get a job as a, as a primatologist at Sue Savage Rumbo, you should never say it about the ape if, if you're going on a, on a job interview. You should always say he or she. Um, just that you know. <laughs> um, so, um, so once you get to this stage, uh, once you get to this point, you get uh, so an ape has, ape has language. Uh, does that mean? And there's a, I mean, there's a written language for the ape. Does that mean um, we can? Tr is it possible to translate human language for apes? Um, and if so, what? I mean, what would you start with? Um, well, there's various reasons to start with the Gilgamesh epic. I mean, the first one is very simple because it's the oldest known, uh, I mean, on, the, on textual basis, it's the oldest known um, form of literature we have. Uh, I think the, the oldest um, clay tablets date back to 5,000 years. It's the oldest, I mean, it's the oldest literature we've got as, as, a, as a text. Um, even though, of course, the, the original story is much older. Um, but if, if it's right, I should get back to that. Um, and another thing, which is interesting about Gilgamesh is that, and I have to give you the story, I have to try to give, I will try to give you the story very briefly. It's about Gilgamesh, a Babylonian king, uh, all powerful, cruel, uh, ruling over the city of Ur with, um, with um, total cruelty. I mean, he was, a, he was, a, I mean, he was the first dictator. Um, and not, a, not, an, uh, not a very friendly one either. And he was two parts God, so he couldn't, so he couldn't be beaten or he couldn't be, you know, he couldn't sack him or, you know, um, so the gods created Enkidu um, to sort of let to, to make sure that Gilgamesh saw the light. And Gil Gilgamesh is also two, two thirds god, and he's an ape man. I mean, he's human, uh, but he's got hair all over him. Um, he lives off the land, and he can speak with the animals. So right there, um, you've got this distinction between civilization and nature. Um, which some, I mean, which is a, a boundary which somehow has to be uh, resolved right there, 5,000 years ago. Um, which is interesting because, of course, that's exactly what ape language research is doing. Uh, I mean, t 
taking what is essentially human, long thought of, language, and taking it to a non-human species, or no, the non-human primate. Um, and another thing is, is that um, Enkidu was probably an ape. And you can see this. I mean, I'm, I'm not the one who saw this first. I mean, you can Google Enkidu an ape and you'll get this image. Um, there's Gilgamesh with the beard uh, on the uh, left. And then you'll see Enkidu sitting here on top of the bull of, bull of heaven. And you can see he's got a very distinct chimpanzee-like face. So, um, so my wild theory is that, I mean, as, as I said, Gilgamesh epic is, much, um, is certainly much older than, than the written version. Um, so, so my wild theory is that uh, Gilgamesh is like a remnant of the first, dis of the first recognition that um, the ape and the human line were diverging. And the human looked down and looked at the ape um, and thought, something is going on here. You're familiar, but you're not really familiar. And that uh, this, I mean, this would be like three million years ago. I mean, I, c I can't substantiate it. Um, but um, so yeah, Enkidu is an ape. And I mean, and then, I mean, the next step, I mean, you could easily imagine that maybe if, if apes have a literature, they also got a story of re reminiscent of Gilgamesh. And it's, a, it's, a, it's the other way around. It's the ape remembering um, the branching of the, of the human line, who knows? Um, so we've already seen the lexigrams. I mean, they're, they're very hard to use. There's no dictionary. Um, I mean, the quality is not very good, as you can find them online. So I, I needed to draw them uh, again. I'm not very good at this. I use a Microsoft Paint, which is a, which is a joy. I needed to, f I mean, I needed to, I mean, I didn't want to invent uh, new lexigrams, but, it, but I had to invent Gilgamesh and Enkidu. And there's a few examples uh, below. And this is a and this is a s sample page of the translation. Now the problem, of course, as you can imagine, is that we're translating from a rich source, which is uh, you know an English translation, to a very narrow source, uh, which has only 200 words, um, most of which are about food or name people, or name researchers uh, somewhere in America. Um, so there's a, I mean you need I mean it's, it's a very um, I mean it's like a you know. Uh, it's, it's, a very, it's, a, it's, a, it's from rich to very poor, so it, so it's I mean it's very simple and but it's sort of um, I don't know um, I don't know it's just what it is. Um, and this actually is the part. Um, what happens is that um, I mean it's, and it's a very cruel story as well because Gilgamesh recognizes that uh, Enkidu is the only is the only one who's at his level of strength. I mean that. I mean, think of it in two of the front terms. I mean, who can beat Contador? Well, there's only Andy Slack. Um, now imagine um, Contador is very cruel, uh, and Andy Slack is very, very generous, and friendly, and uh, you know, uh, loved by all the people. Um, so you're equally good, but the other one is respected as well, and that's very hard to hard to bear. Um, so Gilgamesh tries to corrupt Enkidu, um, and he does that by sex, of course. Um, and then Enkidu has a new feeling. Uh, he's, not lo he's no longer happy in, in the outdoors. And then he goes to the, to the, to the palace of Enkidu. So there he's spoiled. Um, so it's, yeah, it's one of the key passages in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the myth. And, he, and here's another one. Um, this is also quite interesting because the, the Gilgamesh epic has a... Has a s I, mean it's not, I mean, it's not one, sing one book. It's like... It's like a, a fragment. Of, I mean, it's, a, it's sort of collect, like a, like a collection of uh, things. So one of them is a, is a flood myth, uh, very similar to the one you find in the Bible, much older, and also different at points. Um, so I've, I, I've, I attempted to translate that uh, the, the, the flood story for the apes. Um, now, of course, um, the question is, would an ape be able to understand it? Uh, the answer is, I don't know. Uh, but there's a few things I can say about it. Um, and the one, um, um, well, yeah, let's start with the Jabberwocky. This is a Jab I mean, you see a part of the Jabberwocky poem, which is from um, um, Alice in Wonderland, Lewis, uh, what's his name? Lewis Carroll. And then um, Alice says about it, I don't, know, I don't exactly know what they are. Some Somehow it seems to fill my head with ideas. I don't know exactly what they are. And I think it would be great uh, if an ape somewhere, uh, language trained or lexigram trained, would find uh, the, 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 like the Gilgamesh book in lexigrams 
and have the sort of the Jabberwocky experience, he or she wouldn't really get it, but get certain ideas from it. Um, and that will be the first step to like a, like a, the next step will be to pro to, to 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 properly understand it. Um, but th I mean, it's, this is not this is not as strange as it might look, um, in the sense that we I mean we have known for a long time that uh, chimpanzees understand um, uh, uh, photographs in the way um, they are meant they are meant they are, they are intended uh, to be looked at. Um, so there's a famous anecdote of Lucy the chimp. This was a long time ago. Um, and this is, this is before the, 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 the ASL or the uh, lexigram work. And um, Lucy failed to, failed to learn the language. But she had this, and she was home reared. Um, and what she did, she, uh, she was entertained, and the, uh, the, 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 the psychologist couple gave her the, the Playgirl magazine. And she would use, uh, use the, play, the, the images in the Playgirl magazine to uh, masturbate. Um, and she would rub her genitals on the, well. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I'm not telling you. I mean, I'm not telling you this because I like telling you this, but um, <laughs> because it's the. F I mean, it's a very graphic, uh, and it's also the very first evidence um, that an ape can look at a picture and uh, understands it exactly um, by what it's supposed to mean. Um, so, I mean, that's that's. I mean, that's one clue that an ape can can understand an image. Um, we also know that apes um, like television, so they like watching, and they especially like. Um, as Savage Rumbaugh described it, uh, scenes of danger and danger resolved. Um, so apes like watching King Kong, especially. They like to watch other apes. Um, and they also like to watch um, uh, videos about, about uh, of other apes. You know, I mean, not, not films, but uh, just you know, random footage. And again, um, thinking of Enkidu as an ape uh, probably makes the story of Gilgamesh in Lexagrams even more endearing to the ape because it's about him or herself in a way. Um, and another thing uh, about it is that, or another, um, this, these are, and th they're, hard to, uh, they're hard to imagine, but they're, they're a real you know, primate poetic watershed. This, these are made by a, a bonobo called uh, Pambanesia, so it's a second generation uh, bonobo. Uh, I'm saying this because it's important, because um, with every new generation, you get more, um, the apes are more um, encultured to, to in, in terms of um, human culture, in terms of uh, literacy. So you see that with a new generation of apes in, in a research program, that they do new things. Um, so um, what I'm really saying is that primate poetics is only at, it, at, at its beginning, and that it will take another thousand years um, for it to really sort of, uh, for, for the to be on our, on our own uh, level, like. Um, anyway, um, so this is uh, Pambanesia, and this is described that she was, uh, that it was raining, and for, for health reasons, they're not allowed to go outside uh, when it's raining, and she really, really, really wanted to go, and she was looking out of the window, you know, all, s all sad and gloomy, and um, at a certain point, she took, her, uh, she took a piece of chalk and wrote down the, the, the lexigrams for the place where she wanted to go on the floor. And this was the first time um, that an ape, um, that, I mean, the ape had invented writing, uh, which, is, I mean, which is a real breakthrough. And it's another, I mean, for me, it's another indication that, um, that an ape is able to understand a piece of literature. And uh, yeah, that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. So back to the Playgirl magazine. Um, no, sorry. Uh, thinking about uh, what I wanted you to actually elaborate on a bit more, and I hope that you uh, can actually, is the actual uh, design of the um, the marks that you had to create. So Enkidu, for example. Like, I mean, you know, where did you, you know, obviously the original lexigrams were an inspiration, but sitting there, you, the computer, Microsoft Paint, and you waited for inspiration to hit, or you combined them together, or? No. I, I lit literally did that in five minutes. <laughs> Less. But Enkidu is such a designed, beautiful, I mean, it's just show us Enkidu it's, again. It's, it's beginner's <laughs> luck. That's the only thing you can say about it. I mean, look at that. That's amazing. I, I don't believe that that took five minutes. It's, it's, it's a first attempt. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm very bad at these things. And I mean, 
I mean, and they look. I mean, they look a bit crappy. And if you look, go at the, at the, if you look at the at the at the, at the book, at the, at the PDF, you can download of the, for the full story. I mean, it, lo it looks all crap. I mean, these are sort of alright, but you can you can definitely see that the lines are not all aligned and the. And yeah, the but compared to the original set, they don't look well, so hot true. either. Come on. Well, that's true. But I I often think that if I would would have bothered to to contact a proper designer, you know, I would have been featured in you know. Bloody Ape magazine. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, but it, I mean, it doesn't really like matter. Playgirl. <laughs> Playgirl is still waiting to hear from you. Yeah, I think we can. Uh, I, I don't know. For me, I, I, I would like to still continue trying to get more out of you about these lexigrams because obviously, uh, I mean, I don't know if there's anything uh, follow ups uh, planned in your uh, Primate Poetics project in terms of more publications. I mean, uh, Gilgamesh is an obvious place to start, um, as you pointed out. It's the oldest story. I mean, where where could you or would you or have you thought about going anywhere next? And would you then have to design more, spend more time, engage a real designer, etc.? Um, to be frankly honest, I, don't, I think this is the end for the for this bit. I mean, uh, I mean, it hasn't been tested. That's another, that's another thing. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a question I was expecting from you. Oh, it's coming. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, but um, uh, I never. I mean, I never. I mean, uh, I mean these. I mean, um, I mean. There's only one real project left: uh, the Great Ape Trust in Ohio, and uh, they do great works. And I suspect they get bombarded with cranks and idiots uh, mailing them all sorts of crazy shit. And you know, I didn't really want to want to join the queue, so I never bothered. You know, to get actually to to get an ape to read it, um, I was. I mean, I just. I mean, of course, I do hope that somewhere out there, somebody who's involved, you know, finds it by accident, puts it in front of Pembenisha, and she's, you know, hoots and pants and says, "This is the best thing I've ever read." <laughs> but I mean, it ha I mean, as far as I know, I haven't read it. I mean, as far as I know, it, it hasn't happened yet. And uh, I mean, if there's, if, I mean, if there's, if there's demand from the apes, I will definitely continue my translation uh, streak. Um, and well, as for primates poetics, I mean, the, the problem is that a lot of the work is all, is all, you know, I mean, uh, is all uh, late 80s. That, uh, sorry, late 70s. That's like the the main um, the main period of publications. So there's not much there's not much happening. So I keep trying to keep up with what, what with, with new developments. Has been one today, actually. Uh, I mean, there was a piece on the BBC website that apes are uh, capable of distinguishing synthetic sounds from from uh, proper spoken sounds. You've seen this, or that they can understand speech even if it's broken. Um, which I mean, which is an, which is a really I mean, which is another interesting. Well, it's probably a breakthrough actually, because it means that um, their capacity for under, for understanding language. It was much, much greater than realized before, even though the production side sort of lags behind. But then, well, no, no. Well, sure, that, I'm sure there's lots of uh, cranks approaching the place in Ohio, but with, a, say, an organization like V2 backing you up, I think they might pay you some attention, Wilfred, so have you ever thought about that? I think that you're overrating yourself. <laughs> oh! <laughs> See, it's real, this doesn't think, well. So uh, you, j you just said that the, you're dealing with s stuff that's like 70s, 80s. So what are the latest developments? This, this has been abandoned as a system? Um, well, it's, 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 well, it's, um, well it's, it's sort of slow cooking. So, um, um, so I mean, I'm still, I'm still trying to make the case of primate poetics as, a, as, a, as the most radical event in literature since the invention of writing. And I think I have, I think I have a case. Um, um, but well, yeah, no, you know, it's, these things need to be substantiated, and they need time to filter through. And I'm, so, I'm, I mean, I'm, I, d I mean, there's still, a, I mean, there's still a few books I haven't read, uh, mainly because they are unavailable. And um, and um, I mean, this. I mean, the one, the one thing about this project is that um, that I keep finding stuff, even though it's like 30 years old, which is still amazing. Uh, or, or Fascinating or strange. So I read this book. I, I'm sorry. I'm not answering any question. I'm just gonna continue, all right. um, like a crank. And um, <laughs> um, and um, but I think. Well, anyway, this is this is a there's a third system by by a married couple called the Premax, 
um, and she's called Anne Premack, and she writes about how she had a how she had a, a sister, and she was uh, mentally um, I don't know what's the correct way to say it mentally backwards, and she couldn't she never um, so so her father was reading her reading a story, and they had and they had to do it over and over again and very slowly for for her sister to understand, and this frustrated her, especially because the sister never learned uh, to read in the end, and then so she was working with this she was trying training. Um, trying to work with this uh, chimpanzee and tr uh, training her to use language. And she wanted the ape to succeed because her sister hadn't. And I thought, what a strange thing to put, put on the ape. So you've got your, <laughs> you know, your, um, your insane sister, to put it unpolitically correct. Um, and then you want the ape to do better to, to revenge your sister. I mean, th that's such a, such a strange thing to put on the ape. It's not, I mean, it's not unethical, really. And um, I mean, this is just a little obscure book, which I just happened to find on eBay. Without, I mean, and then you, I mean, it's not. I mean, the rest of the book is not really that interesting. It's all method methodological. But then this little, I mean, this one paragraph gives such a specific, a such a strange insight into the motivation of the you know scientists working with apes, um, and then makes you understand that, or makes you see that you know it's not. I mean, it's even in, when it's all methodology, there's still a person behind there. Um, and that person is also a crank. <laughs> They're all cranks. <laughs> They're all cranks. No, but uh, what you have to say about people putting things on apes, I think, is really valid because uh, I know the story too of the the ape. What was it, Lucy, that was raised and then ab and ultimately abandoned? I mean, it was a really sad story trying to raise this ape in a human household as a as a baby, and treating her like a human. Well, and then well, that specific story is is, is that's an, that's another great story actually. Should I yeah, tell, tell it. Because uh, Lucy. I mean, in the early days, I mean, now that it's all illegal, especially because it's an endangered species, in the early, in the early days, they would, you would go to Africa, or you would, or somebody would, would, in Africa would shoot a shoot mother chimp um, and then steal the babies. Um, I mean, it's, it's illegal now, but this is how research projects would come by the baby apes. Um, and then it would be, they would be shipped in boxes and sent to America. And then they would be raised by loving parents, even though they were humans. And, um, you know, I, I mean, it really is sad because, it, I mean, the story of, of Lucy where they would, they, would, they would do a test and they would give uh, a, s a set of pictures with apes and people. And, and it was also a picture of Lucy and she had to uh, categorize between humans and apes. And then Lucy would always put her own picture between the people. Um, I mean, how schizophrenic is that? And then, of course, when, once a chimp get older, they're really, really, really strong. I mean, you can rip your arm out any, any second once they're, I know, past four or five, I don't know, six years old. So you can't, you can't keep them in a house. Um, they didn't want to put them into a zoo because she was loved, 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 loved and looked after. Um, but then, I mean, and, and you know, a chimp like that could probably wouldn't survive between, you know, sort of wild apes in the zoo. So they decided to ship her back. Um, so he, she went to a retraining program which lasted for three months somewhere in, I think it was Tanzania. And then she was shot by hunters, and this probably happened because she saw humans for the first time and thought, ah, now I get <laughs> something friendly and they bring magazines and we, do pl we start to play games. And it just shut her. I mean, how sad is that? Yeah, it's a terrible story. But, uh, and also, it, it kind of, you know, less extreme, but it brings us back to this whole question of, yeah, teaching them our language as, a, you know, as opposed to what you talked about before, this kind of, there's this two-way street. And I love the story you told about the ape kind of making fun of with the hand signals. Uh, the human that wasn't doing a very good job. Do you have any other evidence of that kind of uh, two-way? Because uh, I, I find that the most interesting aspect of some of these stories. Um, um, well, not well. I mean, another thing I haven't said. This is not really answering your question. <laughs> it's um, perfectly okay. But I think it's interesting. I mean, um, is that? Um, I mean, if you talk about language ability of apes and they're reinventing the language in their own terms, is that they invent their own signs? Um, but then this immediately leads to all sorts of, and they like to swear as well, uh, which is quite painful because you, I mean, you know, you don't want to. I mean, I've got a, I've got a three-year-old myself, and she started to swear on holiday because her grandmother told her that, um, and I didn't really feel very happy about it. And, and I mean, if you're training apes, that's the same thing, and, and they would swear a lot. I mean, not just a bit. But it's a very good, I mean, I mean, it's not very nice, but it's a very good evidence of language ability, like f free use of language and the free command of, you know, using it in the way you seem fit, even though in a, not in a way that's trained. Um, so they're, they're using, so they're inventing their own words. And what they also do quite a lot is that they uh, sign to themselves. 
um, are they, I mean, both with their hands and both with electrical. Like board. they're talking to themselves. They're talking to themselves. Mm. And, then the, and then what are they talking about? And, um, well, it seems that they're, they're sort of, that when they're t talking to themselves, it seems that they're sort of um, trying to work out scenarios. Like something happened to them. So I've been bad, I've been bad, I shouldn't, I should behave better, stuff like that. Really? Oh. Well, it has been said, yeah. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Wilfred. Thank you. So, Elio, rounding out our lineup tonight. I'll just introduce you. Uh, Elio Cacaval's research projects involve collaborations with scientists, social scientists, and bioethicists. The transdisciplinary nature of his projects seek an understanding of the role of design in creating a dialogue between life sciences and everyday life. He has exhibited, published, and lectured widely. He has a master's from the Royal College of Art in Design Products and has visiting research positions at Goldsmiths, Reading University, Imperial College London, and he's visiting lecturer on the MA Design Interactions course at the Royal College of Art. His My Bio Xenotransplant is in the permanent collection of the MoMA New York. Welcome, Elio. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, probably the first things I should say, thanks for the invitation. It's a really pleasure to be here and be part of this uh, quite amusing and interesting panel, I must say. Um, w just a very brief introduction. So my background is in um, product design, which means I design things that people use, such as, you know, sort of uh, mobile phones, computers, and so on. But also being an academic, I had a chance to sort of get involved with research, and this is something that I've done for the past 10 years by uh, one of the sort of... Uh, uh, things that I've uh, started to get interested in was the way how design could be used as a, as a tool for his philosophical inquiry uh, in relation to biomedical science and the way how that sort of links also to the field of bioethics. And I've done that through various projects and collaborations with various, uh, various experts from science educators and uh, uh, bioethicists and uh, life scientists and so on. Uh, either from a social cultural perspective, as I said, or an ethical perspective, or from a sort of a science perspective by going into the lab and work with technologies and so on. But I was very delighted to be a sort of a, a, a approached by Michelle, who asked me to talk about a specific project, which I sort of it was very much what all you know sort of what triggered this interest in uh, sort of a, in this idea of using design for sort of a philosophical inquiry in relation to biomedical science. And the project is called uh, Utility Pets, which is something that I've done probably eight, eight nine years ago. So it's very much sort of uh, the beginning of this journey, if you like. And this all started by, because I came across the story of uh, Robert Pennington, who is the first person in the world who received xenotransplantation. So xenotransplantation is the uh, 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 organ transplant from animals into humans, pigs more specifically. And uh, reading about those, you know, Robert, what it was interesting is the way how uh, his relationships obviously with pigs has changed and the way how he actually relates to pigs very differently to the point that he carries Wilbur's... Oh, by the way, so that's uh, Robert, and that's Wilbur, who is the p uh, pig who saved Robert's life. Uh, and, uh, and it's fascinating because one of the things that uh, sort of Robert talks about is the way how he has, for example, uh, Robert's pictures in his wallet. Uh, and also he has uh, Robert's pictures next to his family pictures at home. So Robert is very much sort of, a, as you can see from small details which are quite mundane, cl clearly the, you know, the relationship is sort of a, uh, a, a sort of a restructure around the, uh, a, a sort of humans in a much more sort of a, a human way, if you like. And the, the, the quote, I guess, from Benjamin Franklin sort of encapsulates this idea, you know, how far we go uh, in, in relation to the, you know, sort of our desires or needs or a sort of expectation when we talk, you know, when we deal with uh, other species and when we actually deal with human or human relationships to the point that, you know, sort of everything has, uh, uh, one has a mind to do so in a way that, you know, everything is possible, if we like, simply because we decided, obviously we have decided for uh, that we are, you know, the most superior species, hence the fact that we can make decisions for, uh, and tonight is a good example, the fact that, you know, we can bring a cat, play with an iPad, and uh, I always wonder, you know, sort of this idea of if there wasn't even a more superior space than humans, and they were probably twice as the size of us, I could imagine, you know, the thought of uh, someone who's much bigger than me pulls me from my neck and is putting me into sort of an, an enclosure, despite the fact if I want or that or not, you know, sort of. Uh, um, but uh, clearly, xenotransplantation is quite... Uh, sort of a uh, di uh, sort of a uh, distant from uh, you know uh, 
everyday life because clearly it's um, you know it's something quite experimental and uh, and it's also not something that you know sort of uh, it's something that uh, every you know sort of you read every day in the paper or you might go to a shop and you know you sort of encounter with that sort of technology and so on or you go to an hospital and you can do that so as a designer it was interesting to look at the kind of material culture which is uh, sort of a surround uh, human or human relationship and clearly you know a fantastic sort of a, a, a place to do so. To, to do that is uh, clearly starting from the, the sort of the, from domestic animals, the kind of things that we do with the you know the animals that we surround ourselves in our homes, and uh, and and that's kind of I discovered that you know the kind of things that we do are not far from what's happening with you know transplantation from other technological perspective, also from a sort of a social cultural or sort of a uh, anthropological or sort of a. Um, uh, uh, prospecting the way I we actually sort of you know change uh, the nature of uh, particularly animals uh, through their behavior so through that you know sort of uh, uh, um, uh, genetic sort of uh, uh, makeup and so on and a clear example I'm sure you're all familiar with the zebrafish which you know sort of uh, have been modified with GFP which is the green flows and protein coming from uh, the jellyfish which it makes you know sort of the jellyfish glow but what is interesting about the, uh, the zebra fish is the fact that you know, now you can buy them in the States and in, uh, in uh, um, uh, Taiwan as pets. In Europe, obviously, you cannot buy them yet because uh, the legislation and you know, the policies around GM organisms are much more strict. But what is fascinating is that the zebra fish were originally developed as a biosensor to detect pollution in the water. So you know they will glow if there is a specific chemical ar chemical agent in the w in, uh, agent in the water. But then clearly the the most sort of uh, logical thing to do, and the fact that you can make so much you know money shifting from uh, uh, sort of scientific research into the marketplace by uh, finding an application which is linked to the pet industry. So the scientists that developed that the technology sort of sold the patent to the, you know to actually use that in the you know for the sort of um, the fish industry for you know for people who keep pets at home. And they're purely ornamental, you know, they don't do more than, you know, they're actually glowing in the dark when you switch off the light. But here's there's a nice... Oops, sorry. Apparently, these fish are normally a pale, fleshy colour. But just like the freaky glowing pigs, they've had a gene put into them which makes them fluoresce. Only this time it's not from jellyfish, it's from coral. The gene is taken out of the sea coral. It can be done with a jellyfish gene, uh, but these are done with sea coral. And as soon as the egg is fertilized, the gene is added to the egg, mm -hmm. and then it integrates into the DNA. These fish were originally developed as a kind of early warning system for toxins in water. The idea was that you drop them into a bucket of water taken from a river, and if the water was polluted, I'm showing then the, the gene would switch on, and the fish would start to at glow. The end. So is that what they use for now? The scientists are still working on the switch to detect pollutants. Uh, at this point, we're currently using them in the uh, ornamental fish market, the, the uh, otherwise known as the pet fish market. So they're just pets? They're Absolutely. Just... And keep them, use them in, in their house for enjoyment, stress release. As it turns out, these stress-relieving toys are the first genetically modified That's animals better. on Wait. sale to the public anywhere in the world. Does this mean we could be looking at a future of glow-in-the-dark pet shops? Fluorescence marker gene technology works with all cells and organisms up to people. There's a green fluorescent rabbit. There's been a monkey that was green fluorescent. Why don't you sell those in pet shops? Uh, there, we have not gotten beyond fish. I mean, we're looking at a specific market, and that's really a business issue. So. This is the guy who actually, you know, sort of the working for the company in the States, and he sort of justifies his answer was clearly, we're not interested because it's purely a market yeah. sort of uh, issue. That's why we're not developing, you know, sort of glow in the dark dogs or cats. Although there have been, you know, some scientists in, uh, in Asia have uh, sort of had cats and dogs uh, sort of uh, glowing in the dark using GFP. And then you have things like this. This is a company in the States called Lifestyle Pets. And uh, what they do, they produce new breed of, uh, a breed of uh, animals, sort of, if you like, mainly cats and dogs. Uh, this one is called the Ashera Cat. And it's basically combining the, the aesthetic pattern of, uh, of the aesthetic of a, of a leopard with a behavioral pattern of a domestic cat. And the final result is what you get. It's like, you know, sort of a cat, sort of a leopard, which it behaves like a kitten. And there are people around the world that are buying them. I think this costs... 
uh, $22,000. So you can order them online and you, can, and you get them after, you know, sort of several months that you order them. And it's, it seems to be, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of it's done in a kind of very mundane way. You know, you go online, you order it, and then you get it, you know, through the post eventually. And then people accept that as a, just an option which the marketplace offers them, you know. Uh, but in itself, it's a, a gold example of pure rationality if you think about it because it's an, artifi it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's an artificial creation based on aesthetic, and, you know, and, and, and then the same company does um, the hypoallergenic dogs and cats, which is for people who actually love to have pets, but they cannot have them because they are allergic to them. And the, the gene is in the saliva, so this gene has been removed. And, uh, and then it hands the fact that you know you can have hypoallergenic uh, cats and dogs. Here there's another quite short video. All right, well, dogs aren't the only ones that have been in the news lately. I was fascinated about this. I heard about this, I think, um, on CNN or something. It's fascinating, but ch check this out. Check out some very special kittens. Over 30 million Americans suffer from cat allergies. I have two daughters, both highly allergic to many things, amongst them cats. But once again, science has come to the rescue. A company called Alerca has developed the world's first hypoallergenic cat. Having a hypoallergenic cat means that if you're allergic, you can be around our cat or any hypoallergenic cat. These genetically altered kitties produce no allergic reactions in humans whatsoever. No sneezing, no itching, no runny eyes, and uh, he's fun and playful, and it's a great pet. If you placed an order... So once again, it's, you know, it's presented as something quite ordinary, but it's, it's just like the zebra fish. It's, in a, you know, sort of, it's a G GM uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, science sort of uh, has been sort of used to uh, alter the not sort of the makeup of, 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 of that cat, which is clearly, you know, it's uh, once again, it's a gold example of pure rationality. I mean, it's simple as that. You have an allergy to cats, you don't have a cat. I mean, you know, it's not that you can get an hypoallergenic <laughs> cat. If it's, uh, and then you have, uh, this one, it's another, you know, gold example of pure rationality where we're very passionate about, you know, arguing that we shouldn't be cloning humans, but then you have companies who actually can clone cats and dogs, which is totally legitimate. But then, you know, what, what does that come from? I don't know. But, uh, you know, like this is just an example of a company called Genetic Savings and Clones. And the way that works, they send you a bio kit at home. You, you know, you have a little uh, sort of a biopsy of your beloved cat passed away or dog. And you send that back into an envelope. And then they clone it. And then, they, you know, after several months, they send you back the cat or the dog which you've, you know, they're cloned. Clearly the behaviors will be different because that's sort of based on the kind of, uh, you know, sort of the n natural sort of uh, uh, the experiential side of it. But uh, the aesthetic will be more or less the same. And then on a, even on a more mundane sort of way, you have products like this one which is produced by a company called Takara. And it's, uh, uh, the product is called Biolingual. And it's a dark bark translator. So it basically translates barks from dogs. And the way it works, I have one. I bought one in Tokyo, and I've also I've used it for, with people and animals, and uh, and it works kind of more or less in the same way. You put that on a dog, or on a, they also have a one for cats, which is called myolingual. And uh, so what do you do? You put that, and when the dog barks, you get little text messages on the, on the handset, which it says, you know, I miss you, I'm hungry, I'm lonely, and. Uh, <laughs> And it has a really nice function, which is actually like uh, when you actually know a home and you leave the bilingual on, it works like an answer machine. <laughs> so it records all the message, the barks, and you get. So when you go back home, you can actually scroll. All, you know, all the you can look at all the texts that you received. You know, from the barks that you received. And this once again highlights, you know, this uh, you know this uh, fantasy. We, if we want to define you know, fantasy, the idea how, how many people say you know, they, can, you know, they can actually talk to their dogs and their, you know, uh, or cats, if you like, because they actually understand each other. So here you have a product to kind of, you know, to kind of, uh, which immediates that particular desire, if you like, or need or fantasy. It depends how you want to sort of look at it. Let me see if I... And then... You have things like this, which I guess, you know, I, I'm not going to explain what it is because it just, you know, the video should be quite self-explanatory.
This is a real ad by a company. Did you get what it is? It's a sex toy for, for, for dogs. And it's, and it's clearly, you can actually get different versions. This is a kind of design, uh, sort of slick, trendy version. And there are some of that, you know, in the marketplace, you find versions which are a bit more crude and graphic, if you like. But, uh, but this is, you know, clearly illustrate, you know, the fact how quite often we, the, you know, there's this, you can look at this in two ways. The way how we tend to uh, humanize animals, so we impose that to, you know, human uh, uh, behavior. So we impose, you know, sort of, uh, or we you sort of uh, project the way how we live, you know, as humans into their, into their life. But then with xenotransplantation, it happens the other way around, where we and sort of, you know, say so that actually humans become, you know, sort of uh, more like animals because there's, you know, and, and there's sort of the idea of the, uh, um, the you know, the notion of uh, hybridization and crossover species and so on. So by doing that, there's this question uh, of, you know, how far would you go? Because then you, you know, it becomes uh, the notion of your superiority and, you know, and, and evolution, it becomes questionable because at, at that point you start to have uh, biological hybrids which are not just anymore humans but something in between. So what does that mean? That is something, you know, something between. So, it be, you know, it's sort of uh, you have apes and then you have, uh, you know, uh, humans. But clearly, the, you know, in, in science there's a lot of uh, research and, uh, and in history there's a, there were quite a lot of aspirational sort of... Uh, desires to, you know, to actually uh, have uh, apes uh, sort of having, you know, sort of combining apes and humans in order to reproduce. So xenotransplantation does that in a way, but we actually, you know, by tra uh, the, the transplantation of an animal organ. And then you have things which are even more mundane and quite a sort of, a, they seem to be, they seem, you know, sort of a quite banal, uh, but uh, you, you know, there are hundreds of different companies on on, uh, online which uh, tailor for, you know, for your beloved pets, we sort of, for in terms of uh, outfits, costumes, you know, and uh, this one is a Japanese company, which makes this uh, sort of a lovely uh, sort of a hat for your, you know, pets. I mean, they're quite sweet, but at the same time, they're quite, you know, if I will go to someone's house and I will see that they had a cat and that cat is wearing that, I would be really worried about the person, you know, the psychology of the person on my friend and so on, because clearly it's a... Uh, and then you have, um, this was actually uh, uh, sort of um, sort of a couple of years ago there was this website, and then now there's, you know, it seems to there are not new website emerging. Uh, this was called uh, catscan.com, and it was a website where people would scan their cats and uh, posted their images online. And there was just a platform for people who enjoy to do that, and they will share images and will write comments, you know, sort of, uh, so to about each other's, you know, sort of uh, images. And it's, you know, it's a quite, I mean, it's a very uh, uh, strange things to do. I would <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, so this is once again when I think about if there was, you know, a, a sort of a space which was superior to us. In terms of scale, the fact that we were smaller, they will force us on a scanner. <laughs> <laughs> and then you will be able to scan them like that. <laughs> so that will be quite interesting. So uh, the talk actually, you know, the title of the talk is borrowing the title of a book which are, uh, by James Serpel, who's a zoologist and a bioethicist working in Pennsylvania, who oh, has written this well, uh, lovely book. Uh, and, and it sort of encapsulates, I, I guess, some of the things that you see in this quote, in which, you know, there's uh, the surrogate aspect the way how we relate to humans, you know, sort of to animals, and the way how we use them for aesthetic pleasure, or to replace human relationships, or to, um, let's say, to, you know, sort of to uh, companionship and entertainment, and clearly, you know, much more if you think about things like xenotransplantation to the point, you know. And what is interesting about xenotransplantation, which goes back to, you know, what you were mentioning uh, the, the, the during your uh, presentation, the way how, if you think of a pig, originally a wild boar, 
then an animal which is used for the production of food, and then people starting to use pigs as pets, and then the next level it's, uh, you know, sort of the xenotransplantation. So you have this transition through time, which occurs because of either the way how socially or culturally we sort of, we, we, you know, we tend to sort of change, or the way how technology changes the way how we live, and so on. So xenotransplantation comes right at the end of that. And this is where utility pets ca comes in again, the design and the way how, you know, sort of as a designer I was interested to sort of to reflect on some of those issues from a philosophical perspective and an ethical perspective. So what I did, I've uh, worked with a bioethicist called uh, Richard Ascroft, who is a professor of bioethics at Queen's Mary, and uh, sort of uh, we kind of thought of, of this story, uh, which is a sort of a cautionary tale in which, uh, which we call a utility pets, in which we imagine that if you want to sort of uh, 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 have an animal organ into your body, a pig uh, organ into your body, you might want to question the evil of, uh, you know, of, of farming and the fact that this animal lives out of sight and is treated in a very sort of, uh, uh, um, uh, um, sort of, in, in a very sort of, you know, sort of uh, ut 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 utilitarian way, if you like. So the idea that this animal, instead of living out of sight, it will come at home and it will spend some time with you and becomes your pet. And, uh, and then there will be a point where perhaps you might need your xenotransplantation to use your pet for your animal uh, uh, sort of a, a transplant, for your, you know, for your tr xenotransplantation. Clearly, um, so there's two ways that you can look at it. The way how perhaps you might decide to have your pig at home as a toolkit, just in case you might eventually be ill one day, or because you might have to have a xenotransplantation and you want to have a sort of a much more closer relationship, an emotional relationship with the animal. So there's this idea about giving and taking. I give you something and you give me something back. And uh, I strongly don't believe in the story, but uh, it, that's why it's a cautionary tale, you know, sort of I don't think that people should have utility pets and they should kill them to take their organs. But what we did, we, we were interested, you know, in using objects to raise some of the questions around, you know, what, you know, do we want xenotransplantation? If that's the case, how do we feel about it? And one of the things that we looked at, obviously, clearly, if you have an, an unlimited supply of organs, um, you might not have to worry about it, you know, to be ill, because clearly, if I have an art, you know, if my art is ill, I can get an art anytime, so it's not like there's a shortage of organs because there's already, you know, an art uh, which is ready there, but, you know, a pig which is ready or kidney or lungs and so on. Um, so the idea that, but so if you, if there's an unlimited supply and you don't have to worry, so if you like smoking or drinking, clearly you don't have to worry about damaging your health. But if you live with your xeno, uh, utility pet in the same house, clearly if you like to smoke, you need to make sure that you don't damage his health by creating passive smoke in the air. And we designed this object which we call the smoke eater, which what she does basically allows you to smoke when your pigs is around you without creating passive smoke which will damage the health of your new set of organs. And it's a, so it's a little smoke extractor if you like. And if we wanted to highlight this notion of, you know, sort of a, this sort of a, a limited supply of, you know, of, of organs and the way how we, we might go about it, you know. Uh, and then we also thought about the uh, emotional relationship that you might have with the animals in which, you know, we, uh, we, if you actually live with, you know, you need to provide some kind of entertainment for the animal because, Im, you know, it's a special animal, hence it requires special care and so on. And this is sort of a, it's a toy. We call it a toy communicator. And what it does, it sort of allows the owner of the uh, utility pet to be in touch with the animal when you're not at home. So the, the toy has a radio transmitter inside. It's like a mobile uh, phone, if you like, or like a baby mo monitor device. And you can talk to the pig, and the pig can actually, you can hear the noises from the pig from distance when you're not, uh, you know, in your home. Uh, so the pig eventually might don't, doesn't get bored. It's a little bit like, you know, if you read about, uh, there's a lot of people actually, you know, I'm sure some of you uh, who have pets leave TVs on and, you know, radios on to keep, anim to keep company to your, you know, or your get, uh, cats and dogs at home, so this is sort of a works on the same level, if you like. And this is more of a sort of a, a psychological uh, um, uh, object in which it uh, works by, uh, there's a u you know, sort of huge literature on the subject of uh, people uh, uh, dreaming about strangers or standing to eat food that they didn't be eat before or received an organ transplant from another human being. And uh, it's uh, kind of difficult to s explain it from a scientific perspective because of the complexity of it. But do people, you know, there's a lot of people actually do dream of strangers, do things that they didn't do before. So this is based on the idea that if you receive an organ uh, transplant from a pig, then you might, you know, what do you do? You, do you start to have some sort of pig behavior? 
or you might dreams about you know you might have dreams about pigs so this is the kind of things that you will do in the morning to check how much of a pig there is inside you to confront yourself in front of the mirror and the object was designed as a very much like you know it will sit in the bathroom because obviously it will be the first place where you might go in the morning after have a, you know you had a bad dream or like a nightmare and so on so it's like very much like a comb or like you know a, a, a hairbrush if you like and this is more, you know, how would you, the way how we remember people, or clearly we, you know, we remember pets and uh, animals that we, we, you know, we loved. Uh, this is based on the idea that um, ha what happens after the xenotransplantation. So it's a kind of like a service which uh, allows you to fill in a form before that you receive your xenotransplant, and you can actually to request, uh, you can request to uh, have a part of the animal be preserved. It could either be a trotter or, you know, the snout or the tail. And this it will be, uh, you know, it will act as a memento uh, to be, you know, to, that you might keep somewhere safe in your home. But obviously, it depends on the kind of relationship that you had with the animal. It might just end up to be a paperweight on your desk. It very much comes down to the kind of relationship that you had with the animal. So that's very much um, the way our, you know, sort of... Uh, the way I sort of what I, was, I, I would like to sort of conclude by saying that uh, I clearly, um, you know, there's something quite uh, wonderful, you know, about the way how we use animals, the way how we live ha with them, and the way and the sort of, uh, and this is sort of this wonderful uh, sort of universe, if you like. At this stage, it doesn't feel any more strange anymore because actually we accept those things, and because we've been doing things for so many years in, in a way. Uh, by even by from a scientific perspective, the thought of teaching an ape, uh, you know, a language in itself, you know, it's a quite an obscure, you know, sort of, although apes are extremely intelligent, but, you know, it's a, it seems to me quite, uh, you know, uh, once again, it's sort of a, uh, it's a, it's, it's a process in which, uh, you know, there's a kind of a, it works on one way rather than, you know, uh, sort of a, uh, so it's not really objective from the thought of, you know, the, uh, the other sort of party and knowledge is far, yeah. This is fun, I want to do it, and so on. In the same way how we, you know, we do things with pets. But uh, going back to the des design, so in, you know, the utility pets, I uh, hope, is sort of allies the fact how you know, objects could use for, to reflect in the way how we act as, um, because you know, there's this differentiation between being a citizen and being a consumer. So as citizens, we're very passionate about all those issues. But then when it comes down to act, when we act as consumers, so we act very rationally. And this is when I think design becomes interesting from a philosophical uh, sort of perspective because you use language of everyday products to engage with people to actually make them to reflect about the idea of what it means to be a citizen and what it means to be a consumer. Thank you. Thank you. I really like the way that you put that, the difference between citizen and consumer, and I think uh, you've really hit something there on the head. Uh, maybe you can share some of the reactions that you got from the project, since it is a tool for reflection. It's a speculative design project. I mean, um, it's not really in mass production, let's put it that way. So, so what were some of the reactions from people that, uh, that saw the project on display? So uh, being quite an old, uh, sort of uh, something that I've done quite a few years ago, I've had a chance to present this project uh, numerous times to various t you know, di different groups of people, from school children to elderly people uh, and, and, so, and so on, and the whole spectrum in between. And if I kind of have to recall a particular you know, sort of event, I remember once I was invited to present the project to a group of elderly people in the uh, UK, and uh, uh, through the Helen Hamlin Research Center, which is this sort of center, at the, which is a research center at the Royal College of Art. And one of the uh, people in the, in the audience uh, uh, told me that I was a horrible human being. Because, uh, and this obviously you need to remember that UK is one of the oldest countries uh, for the sort of adopted animal welfare. And uh, she said, you know, how could you possibly kill your pet, you know, to, to, to take uh, an organ from it? I would rather to, you know, to have someone from a third world country uh, not knowing where that organ is coming from, they actually kill my pet. And, and, uh, and, and I was like, wow, you know. The <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, uh, who's the horrible human being in that? Uh, but we do that, you know, we actually financially, because, you know, we do buy organs from India, we do buy organs from China, and it's uh, because we have, you know, we... Uh, do we? Who does? Well, people, uh, and we're part of them. 
<laughs> I mean, clearly, I haven't done that, but you know, I, I, you know, I don't exclude myself if I was in that extreme. You know, if I was confronted with that life of that, I'm sure the same you know, way that Robert Pennington was asked to take part in his medical trial because he had a liver failure. So you're either going to die or you're going to get pig lib you know, a pig liver in your body. What do you do? Sorry, I had a, well, some people ethically might object to the fact of having an animal organ into their body, but some people will actually find that as a, as a life savior. Well, option. the difference is that it's still uh, n normal in our society to eat pigs. So I would see it, if I was faced with the choice, as not much different than putting bacon on my plate in the morning. Um, but taking the life of a person in a third world country just because they live in a third world country, I wouldn't eat them. So why would I take their organ? You, do you see where I'm going? Yeah, it's but you know, there are people who have actually, you know, sort of, uh, who do that on a daily basis. When I say people, as you know, so yeah, people, yeah. you know, it's, it's actually, it's, it's called, you know, organ tourism. Yeah. It's an established, you know, sort of uh, practice which is done, which is quite, you know, sad in a way because I totally, and I follow yeah. your logic because yeah, we, yeah. we don't eat people in, you know, in developing. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> hopefully <laughs> not. It's, uh, but once again, you know, yeah. it, it's unethical, extremely unethical and problematic, but, uh, mm. yeah. Wow. <laughs> and yeah. how did you respond to her? Um, we, I, I kind of somehow thanked her because of, you know, the objective of the presentation was very much to kind of engage on that level of conversation and, you know, to actually have people to express their opinion about how they will go about their everyday life. And clearly, her response was very much, you know, based on her perhaps having, having a pet in which she will probably be quite emotionally attached to it and not, you know, so, so it was quite, you know, so I think sort of the, 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 the conversation was very pleasant. You know, but uh, clearly, you know, she did realize after that she did say something which was quite problematic and quite controversial, but uh, just clearly after that, uh, that happened. So as you noted, uh, this project is a bit uh, further back in your catalog um, from, what was it, 2000 and, I can't remember. Four. Four, yeah. Uh -huh. Um, and uh, so how has that conversation or the topics that it addressed and uh, the, the mode that you were using to con convey the message, uh, how has that evolved in your practice, your design practice? Um, from, uh, from a sort of, um, it's interesting, you know, how you discover things as you, you know, you, the, some, some, you know, quite often people ask you, what is the most exciting project that you've done? And my answer quite often is the one that I haven't done yet. Because it's uh, clearly, it's, uh, and th that sort of that project is basically to do the fact that the previous project has led me to discover something new. So this project led me to discover, for instance, you know, sort of uh, to, to, re to, to have, uh, like any other research project that I, you know, sort of, it always starts with a question. So one of the interesting things about uh, Kosovo species and biological uh, hybrids in relation to the way how children from categories, so, you know, when you're a child, you learn what is a human and what is an animal. But clearly, we don't learn yet how, what a biological hybrid is or a Kosovo species is. But with new curriculums in, you know, in schools, is, uh, like the 21st century curriculum or the curriculum for excellence, where you teach children what is GM food, what is cloning, and so on. And because in, with science, we're starting to have a lot of uh, you know, this crossover between different species. So I thought of team together with a, a professor of science education, Michael Rice, and the Science Learning Center in London and the Institute of Education. And we sort of uh, developed a research project by looking at uh, the way how, and also Richard Astrop, this is a bioethicist, uh, looking at the way how uh, you can develop uh, teaching uh, tools, objects for children uh, and use them in the classroom to introduce the notion of biological hybrids. And this is where the MyoBio project came about because we sort of uh, did this project and there was a sort of a an evolution of that. And then there are other projects which sort of developed from that as well. Uh, and, and also not just from a design perspective, but also from a methodolo methodological perspective in which for us, you know, the, uh, the work has been used to do training, for instance, for a science teacher uh, to use design methods uh, to, you know, as a way to engage in with children, uh, not just on the kind of on a based on the textbook by actually using props and objects or na narrative and scenarios where you actually engage with them on a... Do you want to describe the MyBio uh, project a little bit? It's, um, uh, it, it's, um, we, we looked at an, uh, sort of an established culture. As I say, the question was, you know, how do you, when you're a child, you know, you, you kind of, uh, 
you know, we found categories, uh, you know, at quite an early stage. Uh, so we, we, what we discovered there was an established culture of pedagogical material, uh, which, um, which is uses the language of dolls uh, to introduce ki children to very complex issues. For instance, there is a company in the States called uh, Shadow Buddies, and they make condition-specific dolls which are used in hospitals quite often for children who are very ill. So for instance, one of the, the dolls that they have is called Oncology Buddy, and it's, uh, yeah, yeah, the doll has uh, leukemia. And, uh, and the way how that is visualized, because it has only little hairs on the head, and it has a sort of a, the tube for the treatment. And one, and it's, it's given as a, a sort of to children to externalize, to help them to externalize their experience, the, the, what they're going through. And then you have things like uh, in UK, there's an organization uh, which is called GASP, which produces uh, uh, teaching aid for uh, in to introduce the effect of uh, smoking on the body, particularly for young children. And they produce this object which is called uh, uh, Susie, no, Sus uh, Smokes for Two, which is which is a jar, and it has a doll head. And uh, you put a cigarette in the mouth, and there's a pump at the back, and in the jar there's a rubber fetus. And you fill up the jar with uh, water, and you pump, and you know, light up the cigarette, and you pump, and then sort of visualize very literally the, you know, what happens to the fetus because the water becomes yellow because of the ni nicotine. And it's used in the classroom about, you know, to introduce uh, women, the effect of smoking on, 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 on the fetus and so on. And there's a lot of other examples. So we use that as an established culture to kind of introduce the notion of biological hybrids. And we developed a range of uh, dolls, uh, which each one of them talks about different sort of, you know, uh, the, uh, explore the, the notion of hybridization, for example, from xenotransplantation to G the use of GFP, GFP or the idea of farming, but not with an FA, but with a pH from pharmaceutical. So the idea how you can use an animal as a bioreactor, for instance, like, you know, the way how uh, cows are used uh, to, in, uh, you know, to produce particular uh, proteins or and uh, um, uh, drugs in, in uh, uh, using their milk. You know, the animal is actually becomes a bioreactor, and that's done because uh, clearly it's much more it's cheaper to have 20 cows, which can do the same work of an industrial plant, you know, a factory, and obviously it's much cheaper. And this is why there's a lot of research going into farming. Uh, yeah. Wow. 20 cows, cheaper than a factory. Yeah, like something like around that, yeah. Yeah, because producing drugs. Yeah, producing, yeah. Sort through of the milk. Yeah. That's harvested through the milk. Yeah. So, so the body acts as a bioreactor, you know, processed. Right. It, yeah. And then the milk is what? It then it's processed industrially, processed. and then, the, the, you know, the, the, the chemicals for the medication of the uh, particular sort of elements are, you know, taken away from it, and they produce, you know, tablets. Wow. Brave new future. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I hadn't heard of that one. I don't know about anyone else. But uh, so this is an interesting one because uh, just to go back, you know, the work. Uh, so this farming thing led us to produce uh, an, uh, uh, like an interactive uh, exhibit for a museum in Spain, in which uh, it was used. The you know, the, uh, um, it was aimed to children. So the museum basically the piece was used as a as a w as a teaching uh, sort of engaging tool through workshops, so the schools were coming to the, to, you know, sort of to, uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the museum, but the, the, the original idea for the piece was actually with the workshop in mind, so it was an exhibit, but it was also a workshop tool, and it was, uh, so we, 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 the, the project was called Animal Farm, and it was a proposal for a, a, a rural landscape in which there were a lot of different factories, and each one, a sort of factory, if you like, place where they were producing different things from animals, and the table had, you know, sort of had some uh, interactive objects tagged by position, a little bit like a monopoly. Why? By moving things around, you will play, and by playing, you actually discover things about, you know, GM organisms and hybridization and so on. Sounds cool. Let's wrap it there. Okay. Thanks, Elio. Very welcome. Now, at this stage in the evening, uh, I imagined we'd have a, a sort of group conversation, and I think at the same time, I should probably just throw it open to the floor. So uh, since we've, uh, we've been up here chatting all night, and you've all been uh, sitting there quite patiently, so um, I suppose I first want to throw out just one question that each of you can maybe address in your own way, and that is uh, I want to know and it, if you can just off the cuff tell me how, uh, through your work uh, in this area, your your ethical position on animals in art has changed, if at all. Like what, just in a nutshell, through this work, how has it been repositioned? You can start at the end, Amy. I, I think it's on. Yeah, I, th I think. 
I'm not really sure how to answer that question, <laughs> actually. I think that the ethical position becomes more um, messy, actually, much more messy and, um, and less defined and, um, and maybe much more interesting uh, in that way that sometimes um, the fact that I'm very um, in love with animals and I want to respect them and yet um, I'm really not a vegetarian. I mean, there's, you know, I, I don't eat a lot of meat, but there, there's a lot of inconsistencies with how we live and work with animals and, and grappling with those things is just complex. And I don't know if, if, I'm, if we all become fully vegetarian, what happens to all of the animals? I mean, you know, like, I don't know if that's the right thing either. So I, I just feel confused by it, to tell you the truth. And the work that I do, um, just makes me think about it more and makes me see a lot of other perspectives, I guess. Go on, Wilfred. <laughs> more messy. Uh, I really have nothing to say on it. I'm sorry. <laughs> my, my well, tell us another tale. No, sorry, yeah. but my ethical <laughs> position is as it was. Is as it was when you started, yeah. All I'm the sorry. stories of Lucy and everything else. I mean, there's, there's like none of this interventionist uh, working with apes has caused any shift or questioning. No, not really. Okay, fair enough. Maybe you, Elio, have uh, shifted. It, uh, well, it hasn't, it actually has shifted, but in a way that, um, in which, you know, we all set up, you know, we set up boundaries. And then I guess by doing this sort of work or being involved with people from different fields, what I've and I'm quite, you know, sort of, I'm pro technologies. I'm excited by the possibilities that we know they offer to us. Clearly, you know, there are boundaries which we need to set up uh, to, to, you know, to avoid the, uh, un, uh, you know, the, 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 the dangerous part. But nevertheless, what is exciting is the way how I, I kind of have, you know, I have this belief that somehow we're all strange, but some of, our, some of us are more than others. And that's sort of, you know, sort of uh, by saying that, you know, I guess, uh, and so encapsulate this notion of ethics, you know, what, what is ethical for me is clearly might be unethical for you, and what is unethical for you, it might be, uh, you know, ethical for me. So, you know, uh, and that comes down to the, you know, to this idea of, uh, of, you know, sort of boundaries. So I could tell you that my boundaries are quite broad. Quite broad, yeah. Yes, <laughs> but... Uh, okay. Does anyone on, uh, on the floor have any questions? I can come and bring the microphone to you. Or, oh, all right, we have one out there already. It's a very good question. Not at the moment. Uh, there's a third, third language system, um, which didn't talk and wasn't really much used. Uh, but it's a kind of a logical system, and I would like to try that on my, on my, on my, on the youngest when he's a bit older. But um, so yeah, that's 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 forthcoming. Well, isn't parenting a, an experiment in and of itself? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so, so, but I think the question is, is that, uh, you know, there might be some more, uh, well, I've done a you might be doing more experiments in terms of language on your children than the average parent, I suppose. Uh, well, not, not really. I've, do, I've done a drawing experiment with the oldest, um, which is, uh, well, that's not really on the topic. I don't know. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> um, what do you what do you want to say? What do you, what do you want me to say about it? Sorry. No, no. I just thought it would be. Uh, no, not really, but I mean. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> Musical you know, microphone. But let me just tell you. I mean, there's a great story I once read about, and someone in America trying to teach his child Klingon, it's next to uh, English. And I, I mean, I've and I thought about doing something myself like that. I've got to think about, about a cling teaching Klingons that it didn't work because it doesn't lack words, like ordinary words like table. Uh, so the... That's an experiment that has to be abandoned quite, quite quickly. Um, um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a waste of opportunity because I won't have you know, that, many, that many kids. I should have done more language experiments with them. 
uh, there's something that I would like to share with you, the downside of teaching animals languages, you know. There was a story in The Guardian, it, I don't know if you've come across the parrot. Uh, this guy had a parrot and uh, he, his name was John. And one day he went back home and the parrot called him Pete. And the guy didn't really pay that much attention and the parrot kept calling him Pete after, you know, weeks. And, in that, and he discovered that his wife was having an affair with a guy called Pete. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the, the s kind of the sad side of that story was that the fact that the guy was very attached to the parrot, but he couldn't, he couldn't tolerate the fact, you know, couldn't handle the fact that he was, you know, calling him Pete, so he had to get rid of it. And it was actually sadder than, you know, for him, splitting out with his wife was not a big deal, but actually the parrot <laughs> was a... Uh, parrot was irreplaceable. Yeah. Well. Does anyone else have any, uh, anything to add? Uh, yeah, my question was about uh, the story of Gilgamesh. It's full of gods, and I was uh, wondering if you were able to translate that concept into an icon. No, I didn't. <laughs> I, it, um, no, I think it left it all in midair. So there's a lot of things happening in mysterious ways, which is already like this in the original. Uh -huh. um, I mean, it's an old story, and it works on different uh, principles than the one we're used to. I mean, it's not a modern story. So there's a lot of strange breaks, which are, I mean, things happen f without a without a reason, which is identifiable identifiable to us, and I just left it that like that in the. Uh, in so the so you, you don't know if they also use them uh, while they are swearing. <laughs> in in the in the Gilgamesh, you mean? Yes. Well, no, I mean the apes. I learned this evening that they swear a lot, so you don't know if they swear using. God, for example. <laughs> 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 that, that's beyond my expertise. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Any more questions from anyone out there? No? I wonder if we should maybe leave it here, to be honest, because I think uh, we have uh, some tired faces, some, uh, some thirst maybe to, uh, to go to the bar. We can also get up and stretch and see what uh, Barbie's up to. She looks like she's taking a snooze. I'm not sure. Maybe we can we can rouse Barbie and get her to uh, to play some play some games and uh, chat maybe a little bit more more informally. So um, if there's nothing further, no last chance questions. Uh, I'd just like to thank you all for coming. Thank the uh, V2 team for making this happen and thank our speakers for their presentations. <laughs>